have our special guest curator, Margaret Weidekamp, and we're going to be learning more about popular culture. What I'm not sure if everybody knows is that we're going to be doing these new discovery stations, and one of the discovery stations is actually going to be a culture cart. We're going to focus on popular culture and women pioneers in that cart. So we're going to have Margaret talk more and sort of inform us more about popular culture at the museum. And I used to be an anthropology major, so I am most excited about this particular presentation. And with that, I'm going to put all the pressure on Margaret and say the floor is yours, Margaret. Excellent. Jenny, thank you so much. I'm delighted to do this today. It's nice. I don't get to see you, but it's nice to know that you're all out there. Um, and I, because I just think this is really interesting stuff. So as Jenny said, um, we've been going back and forth on a lesson plan that she's developed around a popular culture explainers cart, which I think is going to be really exciting. And I think that our visitors are really going to like that a lot. Um, and so what I thought I would do today with this um, webinar is kind of back up a little bit. Rather, I'm not trying to um, duplicate that lesson plan or do anything that specific, but to give you a bigger sense of what the museum does around popular culture at the National Air and Space Museum, specifically from the space history side. Now, I have a counterpart in the aeronautics department. That position is empty right now. They're uh, working on a search for that. Um, so I'm gonna be talking much more on the space side of the house, but a lot of the broad lessons that I'm offering really do apply on the aeronautics side as well. Um, so in addition to being chair of the department, I am the curator for what we call the social and cultural history of spaceflight collection. And I thought I would just give you a kind of really broad overview of the kinds of things that show up in that. And then I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of where you are gonna find this stuff in the museum and a little bit about why we have this in the collection at all. So just to kind of start you from the top left, that gold medallion, it's about an inch, inch and a half um, in diameter, is actually a commemorative that was created by a jeweler that was excited about John Glenn's flight as the first American to orbit the Earth in uh, February of 1962. And so that was created, it's a precious metal medallion uh, set with some gems and some enamel given to Mrs. Glenn, Annie Glenn, who we just lost, um, and then a copy given to the Smithsonian. So this is a rare kind of a one of a kind thing. So that's one kind of thing that goes into the social and cultural history collection. It can also be something like the mission patch that's below it. And that is from STS-93 when Eileen Collins became the first woman commander of the space shuttle mission. And that's the kind of thing, a mission patch that almost anybody can own, that we sell in the gift shop at the museum that you could pick up in a trip to the Cape or to Johnson Space Center in Houston or out to JPL or just online. That's the kind of thing that anyone could have. Those are designed by the astronauts themselves to symbolize what they're doing on their mission and to publicize what they're doing, but that's a kind of everyday collectible. So we can have one of a kind things like the medallion or an everyday collectible that anyone might own. Next to that, we have a Ravel model kit. Um, I would ask by show of hands if, for um, folks who have built models. We keep those less for the little plastic pieces on the little plastic trees inside the box and as much for the preserving uh, material record of the hobby of model making and also in some ways for the artwork that's on, uh, on the front of those packages. So this is from Ravel, this is Everything is Go, which is from a, a Mercury mission, a Mercury Atlas. And you can see here an artist's imagination of what it would look like when that spacecraft separated from the booster itself. Not a view that any human being would have had, but so an artist's imagination of that. So we have those kinds of objects. We have things from space science fiction. So Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, Star Trek, Star Wars, through to Babylon 5. Uh, so you can see a um, Star Trek credit card and some Star Wars stickers down at the bottom. And then we also have things not only from space science fiction, but also memorabilia of the actual space program. And so I've got in the middle on the right hand side, there are two ways of commemorating the Apollo 11 mission um, in the 
the middle, the kind of medallion that was created a commemorative coin. I like this one because they, the artist who was doing this for the mint actually bothered to try to get the three astronauts, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins, to kind of look like them. Very often you just get three heads, like three generic white guys. Um, or in fact, three helmets when they don't even bother with the faces. Um, but this is one where there's a nice attention to detail. And then the one that uh, is just next to it is a piece that I love. It is a lady's leather handbag in the shape of the Apollo Command and Service Module. So this was uh, created by a leather maker who um, made purses and who then presented these to the wives of the Apollo astronauts. And this one comes from uh, Mike Collins' wife who did not want it herself and sent it to work with him. And he then um, donated it to the collection, Mike Collins having been after being on Apollo 11, one of the directors of the National Air and Space Museum. So why do we have these in the collection? Why collect social and cultural artifacts? Well, in many ways, it humanizes the stories of spaceflight. It reminds us that there were real people involved, um, both on board those spacecraft, that that was people's workplace and they made it their own, but also the entire pyramid of the workforce that makes spaceflight happen. And so these social and cultural artifacts remind us of that. And in fact, of really the broadest base of that pyramid, which is public support, which is us, which is owning a mission patch or having something that says, I've gone to a space launch. So I'm gonna go into that a little bit more in a minute. But it also illustrates science fiction, which in many ways is the cultural imagination about spaceflight, that fascination with spaceflight that I would argue is a kind of, in some ways, uniquely American phenomenon or takes a uniquely American form. So in many ways, the shorthand I have for the social and cultural collection is really to say it's the ways that spaceflight has been remembered and the way that spaceflight has been imagined. And we think about what kinds of material things can we have in the collection that allow us to show that. So for instance, this is something that actually NASA had a very big role in creating and regulating. So you'll remember that um, Gus Grissom, this is Liberty 7, uh, which sank and then was brought back up. It's at the Kansas Cosmosphere, but he had a roll of a couple rolls of dimes that he's tucked in his pockets to create space flown memorabilia. That was at a time when NASA wasn't yet thinking about that. Uh, but we know the story of Gemini 3 that um, John, Glenn, John Young was brought a corned beef sandwich for Gus Grissom. Uh, John was going to be, Young was going to be doing an experiment with eating space food. Um, a bit of a jokester, but also decided it was rude to eat in front of someone else. So they uh, packed a corned beef sandwich and brought that on board the spacecraft. Um, and after that, NASA really changed the rules about what could be flown. And they also um, ended the practice of the astronauts being able to name their spacecraft. And so with Gemini 5, we have the beginnings of mission patches, uh, which is Gordon Cooper and Pete Conrad, who put a Conestoga wagon on their mission patch that was about a long duration Gemini flight. It originally said um, nine days or bust. On the side of it, this is a version that covers that up on the side of the Conestoga wagon, on the um, kind of the hood of the wagon. And, um, but it began the practice of the mission patch being designed and then that turn being turned into other things. So this is a, a copy of a commemorative coin, a medallion created for Apollo 13. Uh, you'll see that it has the mission patch design on the front of it and then engraved on the back the dates. Um, and then there have been some controversies around space flown memorabilia by the astronauts themselves. There was a in Apollo 15 about bringing uh, space flown, what are called postal covers. Now it's worth noting the Postal Museum keeps all of the space stamps, the flown covers, things like that. The Muse Air and Space Museum keeps the things that are uh, specific to spaceflight that are not about US mails. So that is a place where we collaborate as one Smithsonian with other museums. But popular culture was not only something that involved the astronauts, it involved the workforce. So we know that in uh, the 1960s, in order to bring attention to the ways that any individual space workers work, 
affected the safety of the astronauts and of the whole mission. They actually collaborated with uh, Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, and uh, were able to use the licensed character of especially Snoopy to create these kinds of banners and posters, things like that. The most prized award given in NASA is actually a silver Snoopy, which is a tiny little silver Snoopy pin uh, that's awarded by the astronauts themselves to people whose work really, they think, especially made their mission safe and what it needed to be. So there's a recognition, I think, that most space flight is not human space flight, but we often end up focusing a lot on that because the astronauts in many ways are the public face of that. So backing up, we started with the astronauts, we've gone to the workers, now we're going to go kind of one circle out, which is the rest of the public commercial souvenirs, where people are interested in expressing their support for this, and that comes either kind of outside in, so someone like, uh, this is a John Glenn button and ribbon on the far left hand side around the world in 89 minutes. It's a lenticular button, which means if you tip it up and down, you get um, the little um, capsule takes off from Florida and circles around John Glenn's head um, and makes a kind of orbit. So you have collectibles like that or like these um, coins that were created by the Franklin Mint that might be uh, available for collectors in a display folder like this, or these kinds of one-of-a-kind rarities. This is a place where Pratt & Whitney wanted to commemorate their connection to the space program, creating the Apollo fuel cells, and so they've created these small kind of um, awards, really, uh, commemoratives to be given to the astronauts demonstrating that connection with the material thing. So I think it's interesting the ways that those go both in and out. And in fact, then they go again, we're gonna go one circle farther out to kind of the rest of the world. Space memorabilia is a really key part of US foreign policy. So these, for instance, are small US flag, small uh, Russian flag that were flown on STS-91 as a part of the shuttle Mir program as the Soviet Union was collapsing. The US started a collaborative program working with the Soviet and then Russian space program um, on docking the shuttle to the mirror and recognizing that carrying these kinds of flags created physical talismans of foreign policy that they then could uh, display, hand out, hang up as a way of demonstrating uh, tangibly this change in policy and this warming of relations at the end of the Cold War. And we see that again are, uh, through ordinary people wanting to express their support for the space program. So we have things in the collections like the space team sticker, or again, a mission patch. This is a, one on the top right is from the 2001 655, is uh, from the Apollo Soyuz test project. But um, you've got things like a bumper sticker, things like this uh, Mercury spacecraft stamp, um, paperweight. There are lots of ways that, especially in the post-Cold War, post-World War II moment, um, we see a real rise in consumer culture, in the easy production of physical things. And I think it really, in many ways, people purchase these, they display them, they own them because they want to demonstrate their public support for their connection to their affinity for spaceflight projects. And so these objects really testify to that um, sense that people had of being witnesses to this history. And so we have that. And then we also have places where we have these kinds of like trading or collector cards, which are um, in the collection in many ways, um, in this case, it's some of the kind of tangible ways that people would have connected to a science fiction property. So something like the Buck Rogers core card 434 down in the bottom left there is from 1934. Um, that really comes out of the comic strips and the radio program that became so popular in the 1930s. Uh, the trading cards and the display set from Flash Gordon that's above it comes slightly later. Um, we've got a, uh, the wrapper up there on the top right from a set of Star Wars cards and an uh, individual trading card from the film Alien, which is a great 
suspense movie, but also really interesting in the ways that it moves from kind of very shiny depiction of space flight that you might have seen in uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001, where everything is kind of new and shiny and unused to this is a real workaday uh, space age depiction where these are, you know, essentially truck, long haul truckers in space who end up in this adventure and where, um, interestingly, the woman ends up being the kind of dramatic lead. So this is stuff that we've really incorporated across the whole whole museum and I'll talk for a couple of minutes about the places that you would find this both downtown and out at the Udvarhazy Center. So when we built the Boeing Milestones of Flight, when we rebuilt it uh, to open in 2016, one of our major themes was culture. So we wanted it to not only be a display of the artifacts of science and technology, but also to talk about the people behind it, politics and power, the business and economics that defined this, and then the ways that this impacted culture. And that really goes back in time to well even before the space age. So I said you'll see some things from the uh, aeronautics side. Ballooning memorabilia is one of the places that you see this. So uh, we know that the first balloon flights really sparked a popular culture reaction in the 1780s. And so we have this decorative fan on the left-hand side from the Kendall Collection, which is depicting the ascent of uh, J.A.C. Charles' first hydrogen balloon uh, in France in 1783, landed outside of Paris. And you can see the depictions not only of the balloons, but of the, of the people reacting to the balloons. And then on the right-hand side, we actually have a balloon valve uh, from a large historic uh, hot air balloon that we have in the collection. So those pieces then I think are really, I like to think of the popular culture pieces as very much in conversation with some of the science and technology pieces. And I think it often gives our visitors a way in. So if you're asked about why do we have this, one, this isn't something new. These kinds of objects date back to even the 1780s. The museum has been collecting it as long as the museum has existed, so these are not brand new things that have come into the building, uh, but it also has always been a part of the way that uh, aviation and spaceflight have been a part of their larger cultures and supported by that, and I think it makes that materially obvious. So something like the Telstar flight spare, which we have is the, um, this is an actual flight spare of a communication satellite that was flown in 1962. Um, those little solar cells on it that uh, actually are still drawing power from the light that's in uh, milestones when we get to put this back on display. But people may or may not know or recognize the Telstar. A lot of people look at this and think it looks a bit like the Death Star. Um, but many people know the instrumental Telstar by the tornadoes, uh, which came out in that same moment. So one of the things that we did is you'll see if you look closely on the Oops, we have a little bit of a AV problem. Um, so um, we're going to pause for just a second. I saw some interesting comments on the side. In terms of chatting, I didn't realize the origin of the Russian dogs in terms of the Kennedy family. Does anybody have any comments? It's been in the museum's collection since 1974. Yes. Um, we had a little glitch, so we missed you for a But we're good now. All right, all set? Yes. OK. Um, so this is at the museum because in the early 1970s, actually before the downtown museum building opened, um, they had an exhibit called Life in the Universe? Question mark. And the idea was uh, bringing the Star Trek Starship Enterprise studio model. This is the physical model used to sh um, film all those shots that were used in uh, the 1960s television program, which aired on NBC from 1966 to 1969. This was then a vision of what it would look like to be a real interstellar species going from place to place. And so 
we have that on display when we rebuild um, the south lobby of milestones this will be going back on display on the other side of it now still right now in uh, moving beyond earth which will in its uh, new version be called at home in space uh, we have things like this um, spaceship from buck rogers which i think you'll see is not only it's a kind of hybrid it's a little bit of a rocket but it's also a lot of a kind of winged spaceship and so uh, buck rogers which started as a comic strip in 1928 really becomes an important vision in American culture um, for the, I would argue, very American form of space science fiction. Uh, a crew with a, um, a lead and a sidekick and a, um, a female love interest who has a lot of moxie but a terrible tendency to be captured and need rescuing um, a kind of avuncular character who's either a scientist or some sort of a doctor and they and then get on a named spaceship and rocket off to a kind of space-based place for their adventures. In many ways it's really very deeply rooted in the American Western and you can see how that same the kind of the lead cowboy with his name horse with a name who also is a character has a sidekick has this kind of you know Doc Holliday or some sort of a um, of older uh, avuncular character who advises him the love interest and who is um, always out exploring this frontier is very much shapes the way that Americans think about science fiction and in fact have exported this so much that we don't even think of it as a thing um, that is culturally rooted and culturally specific. I'm uh, a couple of weeks from finishing my book on that and um, I'm excited to get that out. So we have things like that that root um, our story about the shuttle, the International Space Station and future human spaceflight in something as early as a space uh, plane shown in the Buck Rogers series. And then we have things like these space shuttle toys um, that we have on display in Moving Beyond Earth, which really illustrate the many ways that kids use material objects and culture to familiarize themselves with this, to understand this as a vehicle that goes into space that is distinct from a airplane, for instance. So the same way that you learn, you know, what a cow says and what a sheep says and what that's a truck and that's a car, um, the space shuttle comes into um, kiddom often through toys as a way for kids to be able to literally grasp that and understand that and come to understand what that vehicle is. If you're out at the Udvarhazi Center, uh, most of our popular culture objects are in the science fiction toys case, which is in the McDonnell uh, space hangar. And so you see here a couple of my shots just of uh, the display of ray guns that we have, some of these toys, uh, including that um, one that eventually we moved, to the Buck Rogers toy in the back that you'll recognize that we moved downtown, um, and some of the Barbies. These are the kinds of things that if you're doing this popular culture station will be a little more available to you. So I've already talked about the roots of American space science fiction in the Western as a genre. Um, I think in many ways that really explains why every space hero has a phaser or a blaster or some sort of sidearm, um, which if you really think about it makes zero sense in the space context that you would have a small range um, sidearm as something that is a part of your space adventure, but it is ubiquitous. Uh, Buck Rogers has it, Flash Gordon has it, Luke Skywalker had one. Um, you know, any adventure that you see, and if you start to look at the movie posters, you'll see many ways that they're often posed a bit like Westerns. I think part of what's so interesting about this is also the ways that um, ray guns tend to kind of, and science fiction tends to grab the latest technology and, um, be one of the ways that we grapple with that. So you'll see um, these kinds of guns that were created in the 1940s tend to all of a sudden be atomic guns or that we have one there back there that's a space jet. Um, they are the one that's white with the kind of very clear nozzle on the back left uh, is a laser gun. So that's a new technology that is invented in 1960. Um, the analogy that I often use that most people know is if you think about, if you read um, Spider-Man back in the day, Spider-Man became Spider-Man because he was bitten by a radioactive spider. But if you've seen the newer 
films that revived that uh, very popular character. Now Spider-Man is built is bitten by a genetically engineered spider. So we're not afraid of atomic energy anymore, but we do have some concerns about genetic engineering and that's something that science fiction allows us to kind of wrap our heads around. So ray guns, I think, are a really rich toy that um, allowed people to enter into that universe. We also have things like the Barbie dolls. Um, and these, we have three different astronaut costumes from, from the left, 1985, 1965, and 1992. We don't necessarily do Barbie because we're advocating for Barbie. Barbie has uh, been rather controversial over time. She was created in um, 1959 to be a doll of a, um, what was called at the time, a single career girl. Um, so not a baby doll that allowed the player to imagine that she was a mommy taking care of dolls, but that she could act out the life of being a young adult through the Barbie doll. And um, for that then, Barbie has had a whole series of careers, um, starting with being a lounge singer, which um, kind of fit with the very unrealistic body image that Barbie for a very long time has. And Mattel as a company has been experimenting with different body shapes for Barbie of late, as well as uh, commemorative Barbies that include uh, one of Katherine Johnson, the uh, NASA mathematician, Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, um, I think having these really shows one of the ways that since it was a stereotypical girl's toy, um, that the space context came into both girl's toys and boy's toys. Um, and so we have those various examples from again, 85, 65, and 1992. I think the popular culture station is thinking about having um, Barbies on as a way of allowing people to kind of wrestle with some of the different parts of the space story and how women fit into that space story. On the right hand side, we have some Japanese tin toys, which really would have been very internationally marketed. So we have a kind of a knockoff Robbie the Robot on the far right, uh, based on the popular character from Forbidden Planet, the 1956 film. Um, but there was a moment in the 60s when space flight was so popular that people kind of layered it on to manufacturers, layered it onto all kinds of toys. So in the front, in the foreground, we have a space dog, right? There's not particularly anything spacey about that other than he's a kind of robot dog, but he has some kind of space symbols on him. Um, and then the one on the back is a Red Roscoe robot, which I just think is a kind of fascinating thing. This is a Japanese made toy. In the Japanese context, there's a whole, um, coming in anime and in manga, um, there's a fascination with um, robots with a human soul. And what's interesting is that those same toys, that that's how that would have been sold in a Japanese context, then gets exported and sold in an American context as an astronaut uh, or more internationally as an astronaut. And when we look at the packaging for these, we can see the English labeling on them that really labels them as something that was created for that international audience. So I'm delighted to have some of these toys in the space toys case out at Hazi. Now those are rather near the Close Encounters of the Third Kind mothership model. Now this is not necessarily a um, show that a movie that many people younger uh, than say 50 necessarily remember. This is Steven Spielberg's 1977 movie. He was imagining again a spacecraft that would carry visibly, as soon as you looked at it, you would think that this is something, it's not just a solo ship. This in, clearly holds dozens, hundreds, thousands of aliens. Um, and the detail work on this makes it a particularly wonderful object to, to get to have. There was a um, tradition in movie model making. This is considered a miniature, even though uh, the scale of it is quite large. 
but it's not as big as the actual spacecraft would have been, thus miniature. This was built in Doug Trumbull's studio. Um, he did the special effects for 2001 A Space Odyssey. And um, Greg Jean is a real master model builder, did uh, most of the design work on this. And um, the concept is really fun because there's tons of detail to give the effect that they wanted, but they didn't think anyone would ever get to really see it close up. And so as a result, um, they put all kinds of little inside jokes in that were just for the, their fellow, fellow model builders. Um, and if you have a good flashlight and a laser pointer, um, and if, when you get a chance to give tours, uh, or if you're out there, you can point those out to people and people always enjoy, since it's a kind of dark gray on dark gray, um, the idea was not that these would be obvious, that the idea was in fact that this is a little insider joke that they know they've built these things, an R2-D2, a mailbox, a VW bus, a, a cemetery plot that are on the model and visible, but that would never really show up well in the film itself. And so that's part of the fun of the um, hobby of model making and the profession of model making in the movies. We have a couple of other uh, nice pieces on the left, a uh, phone booth that came from the Kennedy Space Center, a novelty phone booth in the shape of a Mercury spacecraft. Um, and there's a whole other story about getting the payphone to put in there, about trying to find a correct era payphone. Um, and then on loan, we have from the uh, Postal, the National Postal Museum, a uh, official USPS collection box that was skinned for the 30th anniversary of Star Wars in 2007. And these started popping up all over the country. Um, and so I called my colleagues over at the Postal Museum and said, if you're not going after one, I am uh, going to want one for the uh, Air and Space Museum's collection. And they said they already had plans for it um, and they were going to display it short term, but they didn't have a long-term plan. And I said, I can fix that. We've got to, we will find a spot for it out at the Utrahazi Center. So it's a great piece to be able to have on display. Now, not everything we have is on display, and I'll end on uh, this slide, which is a Women of NASA Lego prototypes. So those of you who may have seen this, this really just came out in the last couple of years. This was something that we collected in 2018. And so that on the right is Maya Weinstock, who is a science writer at uh, MIT, and she is a Lego aficionado and had created some of these kits kit bashing, essentially taking existing kits, creating custom pieces, putting um, pieces together in a way that was not what was prescribed by a box and uh, creating a new tableau then. And so she put that up on a website with some very good pictures of it. Um, when you get up to uh, 10,000 votes, upvotes for that, then Lego will officially consider your kit. It doesn't necessarily get it built, but Lego will consider it. And so the women of NASA um, got to 10,000 votes within about a week. It was tremendously popular. Um, it was the best selling toy on Amazon on the day that it debuted. It immediately went to the top of that. The publicity around it had been wonderful. Part of what's interesting about this is the depiction. She had picked five women uh, to be a part of this. So we have Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, Mae Jamison, who's the first African American woman astronaut for NASA. Um, also, Margaret Hamilton, who was another MIT computer scientist who had developed, is considered the rope mother, the head of the team that developed the programming for the Apollo guidance computers. Um, and then also um, Nancy Grace Roman, who's an astronomer who worked for NASA for a very long time and who is considered the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope. Those four are part of the actual kit that you can buy. And we also have a, the commercial version of this kit in the collection. But in addition, she had created another tableau for Katherine Johnson. And when Lego approached Katherine Johnson's family, um, they were not able to come to an agreement to have her as a part of the women of NASA Lego. I'm not sure that that wasn't because they were also already talking to Barbie about having Katherine Johnson depicted in the um, historic Barbie series that just came out this past year. 
So that gives you a really broad overview of the uh, social and cultural history of spaceflight collection. It's an old collection, both in terms of this is popular culture that has existed since ballooning began in the 1780s and had a big public reaction. Uh, it goes through to really today where people are still like Maya Weinstock creating new products that um, allow people to express their excitement about spaceflight to uh, in practice and kind of literally play with, get their hands on um, space things in a way that expresses their excitement and interest about spaceflight. And I think it's one of the things that um, I think our public will really connect with because in many ways this is the most democratic, small d democratic collection, right? So looking in our picture on the left, you can see LM2, the uh, lunar module that's downtown in the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. That's something that a very rare few people got to design and test and build and fly. Popular culture, mission patches, uh, buttons, pins, t-shirts, hats, coffee mugs, toys are things that almost any person can have and almost any household probably has at least one space thing in it somewhere from a Buzz Lightyear toy, um, from the Pixar movies to the women of NASA Legos. Uh, there's been a whole series of Legos done for um, the Apollo Saturn V, for Star Wars. So these are things that ordinary people own, that they have their hands on, that when they come in and they see them in the museum, they have a sense of recognition. Oh, I had that, or the kid down the block had that one. And it is one of the places that I think is a great entry, uh, entry point for our visitors to think about these kind of bigger stories of science and technology and um, how the, those get made and used by starting with something that is sometimes smaller, more personal, and that really uh, nonetheless tells a very big story about aviation and spaceflight. So that's what I'm hoping that you're gonna be able to bring to visitors when you get a chance to work with the Popular Culture Station, which is really gonna emphasize the role of women in spaceflight, and then also the sense of getting hands-on with this and pointing out to people that they've kind of already been hands-on with spaceflight even before they get to that explainer station. They probably have some piece of this in their own home or, or they know someone who does. So I am happy to get to present this to you and I hope that uh, people have some questions. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first was uh, more logistical. Is the station coming to both buildings? And the answer to that is correct. Um, but one question Amy asked, do you have a favorite art artifact? Which I know is like choosing a favorite child. But a favorite child. Um, why? <laughs> so I have a whole series of them. Um, the Star Trek Starship Enterprise Studio model is one that I worked on for about uh, five years intensely on getting the restoration of that done and putting it on display. Uh, it had been in the basement of the gift shop at the National Mall building for uh, since about the year 2000. Uh, that's where it was when I came on board in 2004. And it really was 10 years later when we were taking it off in 2014. Uh, so that's one that... Um, that I uh, have great affection for also because it has, as most of these things do, I like the way that the thing connects you to the people um, and to those stories of people and culture um, because it's very clear in any work around the Star Trek Starship Enterprise model that that's not ours. That's not in, it's in the national collection only in that we keep it and we hold it kind of in trust as we do for all of these things. Uh, but it's particularly clear to me that we do that for the Star Trek fan community, that there's a great sense of ownership of it, um, of her, of the enterprise, um, since they uh, use the naval convention of calling uh, ships a she. And um, so I really do love that artifact. Um, the women of NASA Legos, I think, are particularly fun as a new thing. And um, I'm looking forward to, I'm working with um, some of the 
exhibit teams coming up, probably this will either end up in At Home in Space or the new Future of Space Flight exhibit that we're building in the um, National Mall building. Um, but I like those. And then at uh, Uvra Hazi Center, we have a um, Space Patrol play set that I like for two reasons. One, because usually when the curator goes out to work with an object to put it on display, basically they plop the box on a table and you come in and unpack it and work with it and get to put it on, um, figure out like, you know, what kind of a stand do you want it on? Do you want it to be tilted? How do you want the light to shine on it? Things like that. This I came out to uh, work with and rather than just plopping the box on the table, the collection staff had taken all the pieces out and had built the little wall that goes around the playset and had put the little space station building in the middle of it and had set up all the little astronaut and alien guys with their little cannons and all their accessories and had built me this whole tableau. And I just thought, uh, it just demonstrates how irresistible some of these toys can be that, you know, you couldn't just put it out. You had to like, you had to play with it, you had to set it up. Um, and even folks who work with this stuff every day just couldn't resist uh, the chance to actually get their hands uh, on that and gloved hands, of course, and set it up for me. Um, and that actually was a piece that this space science fiction memorabilia collection largely came from one collector, Michael O'Hara, and that actually, that set had been his set when he was a kid. Um, so it wasn't something he had collected as an adult, as a collector. It was something that he really held very close to his heart. And I um, could, uh, in my discussions with him, I'm always very appreciative that he was willing to trust the Smithsonian with, uh, with that set. So those are my, if I, I'll do my top three. Um, another, there's a, a lot of people who are envious of your position. Um, in terms of, we have a lot of younger viewers. How, what schooling did you have? How did you come to your job? This is not where I thought I would be. And this is a, you know, this is the kind of follow your dreams, try it out and see what happens. Um, so I have a PhD in uh, US history from Cornell University. My dissertation and my first book are about a women's astronaut testing project uh, from the late 50s, early 1960s called Bright Stuff, Wrong Sex. And um, in doing that, I ended up doing a um, fellowship for a year at uh, NASA headquarters in their history office. Um, I had been really approaching things as that story as a women's history, and I got very interested in space history when I was there. My interest in spaceflight had always been more on the fictional side. I grew up as a um, Star Wars kid, just the right age for that, um, to uh, see that first run when it came out, and um, then really became a Star Trek fan um, when I went off to college and was watching Next Generation, things like that, started really following that. And um, so I had created a course when I was teaching, um, both as a graduate assistant at Cornell in the history department, and then as a women's studies professor for three years at a small liberal arts college, I taught a class that I called Gender, Race, Society, and Space. And so it was half space history, half science fiction, mostly looking at women's roles, roles of African Americans, um, people of color and because um, there's a kind of fascinating history of that in um, the history of science fiction and also actual spaceflight, what it took to diversify the astronaut corps or NASA. Um, so, uh, you know, if I was teaching it now, we would totally be reading and watching things like, you know, hidden figures um, and thinking about those kinds of stories. So, um, so that is really how I got to this. And from being at NASA headquarters, I had gotten to know the curators over here at the National Air and Space Museum. And when this job came up to deal with, to be the curator for the social and cultural collection, it was all objects that the museum already had, but they hadn't ever been pulled into one collection for one curator to work with. And um, the idea of getting to kind of get my hands on that and try to make some sense of that, um, really was exciting. It's been a lot of fun. And um, I've done what a little over 15 years, coming up on 16 years at the museum now. And so, as I said, I'm finishing a book that I'm calling Tentatively Space Craze. And it really is a history of America's fascination with spaceflight, especially as told through 
coping with the uh, stuff. So I tend, I open each chapter kind of in the first person. Here I am sitting at a table, usually facing something and thinking, what is this or what do I do with it? Or how do I make sense of this particular object or set of objects? Um, and that then kind of launches me into the story for that chapter. So um, it's something that I've been trying to get my head around and the intellectual challenge of that is, um, you know, part of the delight of getting to do this work. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, there's a, a couple of other questions. You've got an offer to work with the National Naval uh, Museum on a possible panel for Comic Con. I will connect oh, with your Con. Yeah. Comic Con is a great audience. <laughs> and uh, a couple questions like, what is your favorite space travel novel? Space travel novel. Um, Hmm. You know, it's funny because the one that Robert Heinlein's stuff is so um, kind of politically reactionary. Uh, he, uh, in his works like Starship Troopers, really connects um, the franchise, the vote to military service. So there um, are some interesting ways that um, his stuff, uh, on the one hand, depicts women as most of the pilots of the spacecraft because um, He's uh, imagining that, you know, he's thinking about like women's dexterity and some of these very stereotypical ideas about the way that women work. Um, and on the other hand, then he's picturing women flying all the spaceships. Um, so um, Have Space Suit Will Travel is uh, one of his novels from the 1950s. Um, trying to think of... Um, Nettie uh, Okorafor has a, it's not a space flight novel so much as um, I've been looking, I've been recently reading her uh, Bindi series. Uh, and she is a Nigerian American author um, who is, um, her stuff is just so vivid um, in terms of the, the sense of the soil and the people and the, um, you just, uh, the writing is really electric. And uh, I've been enjoying that tremendously and that um is less about the the ships often when i'm doing work around the collection we tend to focus on the travel because it's the place where we intersect the most with the how the fiction has envisioned actual space flight as opposed to costume design or lighting or kinds of you know characters um but uh Nettie okorafor is a a great uh, new writer um, writing in really the last uh, five, 10 years, and um, her stuff is really worth taking a look at. So there, I'll, I'll peg the two ends of that Heinlein and uh, Accor for. And then speaking to your knowledge of the collection, um, one is a little bit more broad and one is specific to now. Um, John uh, was wondering, there's more design it yourself type auto gyros, helicopters, um, are there any plans to showcase that in the museum? Uh, and then another question was, are there any plans to incorporate sci-fi video games into the museum? Mm. I'll take this. So autogyros, uh, that kind of stuff, we're starting to see that on the space side of the house a little bit more. So, um, you know, only what yesterday, we saw the launch of the um, Mars 2020 Perseverance, which includes a, um, a essentially a heli two-bladed helicopter um, that's going to be uh, flying in the Martian atmosphere. I know that that's part of the plan for the Dragonfly mission going to Titan, uh, for which uh, our own Ellen Stofan is um, one of the project scientists. So we're just starting to see that that tends to be something that's incorporated more on the aeronautics side of the house, uh, but it is something where you would also see memorabilia. Um, the second question, talked my way out of it. What it was about, sorry, refresh yeah, me on Like space video games, are we gonna? <laughs> so, the trick on video games, cause some of, the, some of that has really good world building, right? So Halo, something like that is really thinking creatively and immersing people into a great vision of, um, world building and where I get a little hung up and I'd have to think about what to do with it. Um, when we collect objects and it has to be a kind of three-dimensional touchable thing for the museum, um, those tend to come out of television or movie properties rather than necessarily literature or um, video games. 
So, you know, what I'm, I, you don't have a lot of things about literary science fiction. We have a great collection of literary science fiction in the archives and in the library. Um, you know, so the museum holds Arthur C. Clarke's um, papers and some of his personal memorabilia awards, things like that. Um, but nobody really makes like Isaac Asimov action figures, right, in a way that I could physically like set that on a shelf and show people. And that's one of the issues with space themed video games is trying to think about what's the physicality of that because what tends to get exported tends to be kind of character um, action figures or things like that which speak a little less to the space flight part of it and a little more to kind of some of the character building and that's one of the places where we draw a line because if you didn't draw lines, we would drown, right? We would just um, be taking everything in. And so one of the curator's jobs really is to say no more often than we say yes, so that when we say yes, we are really committing the museum's resources to those objects in perpetuity. Um, and so I haven't yet, I think probably on the other side of this book project, video games is one of the things that I need to start thinking about. I know that my colleagues over at American History have thought a lot about video games um, as a cultural form, but not necessarily thinking about them as about space. Although some of the very first um, video games ever developed were space games. So um, that's something that we do, I do know is kept in the collection in terms of the form by, of the game itself, the paper tape and things like that, going back to some very old computers, um, are in the collection of the American History Museum, but I haven't yet got my head around how I would bring a representation of the kind of space content into the collection as a physical thing. I was thinking about one of my favorite trainings, and that was actually, Margaret, you brought the Tribbles. Yes. Uh, so uh, Discovery Station uh, volunteers, facilitators got to learn more about the Tribbles and actually hold one with a glove. Um, so that was pretty cool. Another question that we had was... The original Tribbles from the Trouble with Tribbles episode from uh, the original Star Trek television show. And um, aliens, I think, are just a fascinating... Um, part of this, it's one of the things when I was teaching, especially about gender and race, aliens are often feminized, aliens are very often the other, um, and when you look at how the aliens are depicted, it's often, um, it speaks to the particular moment in which that um, show or television movie was created and kind of what people are grappling with, with who is the other part of the chapter that I'm finishing right now, um, deals with um, Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5 from the um, mid 1990s in the way that you now for the not first time, but one of the first times you start to really see alien characters as a part of the crew complement and depicted sympathetically and in a way that the audience was supposed to identify with them and not just think, you know, here's this weird thing that we've encountered this week that we're going to cope with and then move on um, in the kind of episodic uh, television model. So, um, so yes, tribbles are uh, one, because they're um, very feminized, right? All they do is eat and reproduce um, and, um, and in, and they are beguilingly cute, and in that lies their threat. So I think they're a wonderful um, creation of an alien. I love that. Um, I hadn't quite thought of them in that manner before, so that was pretty cool. Uh, one other question that we had, is there anything famous that the Air and Space Museum has turned down in terms of popular culture adding to our collection? Yeah, so um, it worked out in a very nice way. There's the... Um, Shuttle Galileo, which is the full-size prop of the shuttlecraft Galileo from the original Star Trek television show. So it's full-size. So if you can picture it, it's kind of like um, 
the size of like a conversion van and a half or something like that. So it's a full size prop that actors could walk in and out of. It wasn't really fully kitted out on the inside. The outside was uh, really what they were looking for. It lived, um, it was offered to the museum in the 1970s and the museum turned it down. And then it was offered to the museum again, um, offered to me, um, and I turned it down because we don't have the space really to have something that big and really just have it behind um, stanchions. And um, it also was a case where the object itself had deteriorated tremendously and rebuilding it was really going to bring into question some of these fundamental things that we think about when we're doing conservation, uh, which is really, you know, it, how many parts can you replace and still have it be the original thing, right? You were gonna have to take whole sides of it off and replace it and um, it would all essentially be built on some version of the core frame, um, but it wasn't clear that some pieces of the framework weren't going to need to be replaced. So I had questions about in the end kind of the authenticity of that and what that means to put it on the floor of the Smithsonian of saying that this is the authentic thing in the way that when I can put the Star Trek Starship Enterprise on the floor, that's the thing. That is the this wood and most little bits of plastic, but mostly wood. Um, and that model is original. Um, and so uh, what came out of that was very nice is um, Adam Schneider, who um, owns that, had done led the restoration of that, was looking for a home for it, ultimately took it to Space Center Houston, uh, where it was on display for some time. And then it went up, it was at the, um, uh, the one in New York that has the um, space shuttle enterprise, because the Star Trek use of shuttlecraft is one of the first uses of shuttle associated with a spacecraft um, in the fictional world. And then uh, obviously NASA uses that and adopts that in the 1980s. And so I was very pleased that um, it was one of the places where, you know, saying no nicely and for a well thought out reason, nonetheless built a relationship and Adam was invaluable in the conservation of the Star Trek Enterprise Studio model, helping me to um, really bridge into the conservation world, into the collector's world, get the right people together, um, putting that together. And then I just had to laugh because in the research for that, I was going through the archives at Smithsonian Institution archives and actually found the paperwork from the 1970s that the museum had been offered this same object, you know, 30, 40 years earlier and had already said no. And so there's an odd sense of vindication that I had made the same decision that my uh, curator predecessors had made and, uh, and for similar reasons. So, um, uh, so I got a kick out of getting to send a picture of that to Adam, like, hey, look, I'm not the first person to say no to this. Um, so that is a, a very big, and it's an excellent piece. It's just not something that was best suited to be in our collection. And I think ultimately he found a better place for it. And we do try to work in collaboration with other centers, um, the Air Force Museum, you know, the Museum of Flight, Space Center Houston, things like that to really think about uh, the Kansas Cosmosphere. We don't have to have every single thing as long as we know that things are being well taken care of. Excellent. Uh, one thing that I really adore, especially with the popular culture that the Discovery Station we're making, is the relationship between Star Trek and Mae Jameson. Um, yeah. Are there any, so you can tell that story, or I was just wondering, are there any sort of like specific individuals that you can sort of tell the story that popular culture put them on their path? Um, okay, yeah. so I don't know, put them on their path. Well, so Mae Jameson is a, um, a medical doctor who decided to apply to be an astronaut after Nichelle Nichols, who was the African-American actress who played Lieutenant Uhura in the original Star Trek television program. Um, she actually was hired by NASA in the 1970s to recruit astronauts for that first class of mission specialists that came in to support the space shuttle program. And that was the first time that they were really looking, uh, second time, uh, that they were really looking at non-pilot astronauts. Um, so pilots tend to come out of military uh, training, jet test pilot training primarily, although not exclusively. 
And um, so that was an overwhelmingly male pool from which you were choosing your candidates and therefore you saw that reflected in the astronaut corps. NASA knew in the 1970s in preparation for the shuttle program that they wanted researchers who would be doing work in the shuttle and who therefore um, could come from a more diverse set of backgrounds and represent the face of America better. And so they hired Nichelle Nichols to do this public relations campaign where she did television spots and public uh, service announcements and she was on radio um, and did a whole series of advertisements for them with the idea that there's space for everyone. And um, so, and wearing a NASA flight suit and carrying the kind of the power of that Lieutenant Uhura character behind her. So um, May Jameson decided at that point that maybe this was something that she should look into um, and that uh, took her on her path then to become a uh, astronaut, ultimately flew on the shuttle and appeared uh, in an episode of uh, Star Trek. The other thing I would say is that I was delighted to find when I was going through, I was part of the team that went out to Sally Ride's house after her untimely death in 2012. I was able to work with um, her widow, Dr. Uh, Tamla Shaughnessy, and kind of go through and think about bringing uh, Dr. Ride's artifacts and her um, archives to the National Air and Space Museum, that archival collection has just been digitized and made much more available to people. So that's something I think that when you're talking about women in space, you want to really um, bring to the public's attention um, what wonderful resources we have at the National Air and Space Museum. But she had a um, Star Trek communicator pin that had actually been given to her. She was invited as the first American woman in space to um, the premiere of Star Trek Voyager. Which had the which was the first series to have a woman in command, not the first woman commander we saw on Star Trek. I'm often corrected by fans, uh, but the first time you had a series that had a woman as the commander, and um, so she was given this um, real prop communicator pin um, when she was at this public event uh, with um, the actress who played uh, Commander Janeway. And um, what was fun was realizing that Sally Ride was in her own private life, which was very private, um, a Star Trek fan. So uh, she enjoyed the show, she enjoyed the movies. And um, I don't know that that necessarily put her on her path, but it meant that she kind of had an openness to that kind of um, adventure story and space-based story. And I think that if you um, dig into the astronauts who have been fans of this stuff. If you look at the Apollo astronauts, they were largely pilots, but many of them were fans of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon from their youth. Um, when you look now, you see people who are Star Trek fans or Star Wars fans, people who've brought um, copies of the, um, there's a set of um, DVDs of uh, Serenity of um, Joss Whedon's uh, Firefly that are on board the International Space Station. Uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, who was an Italian astronaut, um, famously brought a uh, Star Trek Voyager costume with her and wore that while she was on the International Space Station. So you don't have to look very far in um, the world, not only of astronauts, but also of space workers to find folks who are often fans of space science fiction as a vision of what it could look like to be going into space and living and working there regularly. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, we have run out of time, so I, I was going to maybe let people ask one more question, but I looked at the time and I'm like, no, I think we're done. So um, we'd like to thank you so much for giving us all this wonderful information. If, if you could look at the chat, a lot of people are a little jealous of your job. They think that you have a really fun job and that you do it very well. So oh, sweet. It is fun and it's and I love the chance to get this information out to visitors and you guys are really how we do that. You're the, you know, um, you are the face of the uh, Air and Space Museum for the folks who come through the doors. And so I really appreciate how much you time you spent to immerse yourself in this material and really be able to bring it out to our visitors. Thank you so much. And with that, we will finish our, our presentation and we uh, will hopefully inspire a lot of people's imaginations with all the work that we learned from you. All right. <laughs> Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming out.